Cool. All right, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me today, uh, joining the community. Welcome to the Open Science Dow Hall. Uh, OpSci is an open science community actively researching and developing web tools for decentralized science. Our key activities uh, bridge a few, few aspects of Web3. Hold on, I need to let somebody in, I think. All right, cool. Um, we bridge cloud services and requirements for open access science commons, research data management uh, with decentralized file storage protocols, reputation, identity, and collaboration for research, token engineering to build alternative systems of value transfer and capture that support uh, to support sustainable knowledge creation systems. Uh, we also provide support and funding for scholars as well as developers in between career gaps to perform basic research or contribute to the growing ecosystem. You can get involved today by joining a working group on Discord or hack.opsci.io uh, to volunteer and join the rack or you can volunteer and join the ranks of our open web fellow mentors. You can also try proposing a research project. Before we dive right in, please make sure to complete the Dow Hall register. We've been recently issuing POAPs for uh, issuing POAPs for, for attendance, and we kind of have a nascent primitive plan coming together uh, to figure out how we can use these to signify contributions to the DSI ecosystem as well as membership. So please make sure that you can claim your POAP by completing the survey. Uh, it'll just ask a very few set of questions so that we can make sure that you can access and claim your POAPs being here today. Cool. All right. So um, I think today's a great chance to kind of take a look back at OPSI um, and what we've accomplished this year and looking forward. So I have just a really kind of quick rundown of what our, you know, why, what's our MO? Why are we here in the first place? When, what, are, what are we going towards? And then Akshata will fill up uh, most of the rest of the time with a discussion on her uh, project, her permanent archival of scientific papers, which is part of her Open Web Fellowship uh, project. And so she's at her midterm presentation now. I'd love to hear your feedback. So if, if you're here today, uh, you're likely attracted to this space, to uh, Web3, DSI, and maybe open science in general, because of this ongoing problem, this kind of pandemic that's been uh, kind of traveling through scientific communities ever since the end of World War II and the introduction of, 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 uh, of, of research institutional funding. Uh, the commercialization of science and the emergence of things like big pharma and the defense industry. And those are broken feedback loops of value flows in research and development, something that we've talked a lot about these past couple of weeks, considering questions like what is the objective function of science and where does value actually go in a scientific ecosystem? Um, you know, what we're doing here really isn't that uh, new or groundbreaking. Uh, science has always been decentralized since uh, the the induction of one of the very first societies of dudes, and I put an emphasis on dudes who like to think about stuff in the 1660s uh, with, the, with, the, with the formation of the Royal Society, which was really a collective of privileged, yeah, definitely privileged individuals, but uh, there weren't any exclusive barriers to access. You just kind of had to integrate in, uh, with the community and, and kind of have a penchant for, for thinking and philosophizing and writing. Uh, so fast forward today, and you know we have a much more egalitarian, flat uh, community for uh, that accepts contributions from all over the world, like the Brain Hack community. It really is a decentralized neuroscientific community that solves problems, um, and you know they host hackathons with on par with the ferocity of the Ethereum ecosystem, where you have a couple hackathons uh, every every few months or so. And so something along the way happened. Uh, between 1660 and 2021, and, and that is that uh, science grew. It, it grew, it became very successful. And along the way, as anything that becomes successful, uh, it started generating value and money and attracting third parties and other economic systems that bootstrapped off of the value creation that science produces. If we take a thousand foot look at how kind of really funding flows in society in general, Almost all innovation, progress, and economic growth can be rooted back down to basic science research at one point or the other. 
And this is at the behest of the government, which collects taxes, right, from industry and reroutes those and chooses um, which basic science projects to fund, the things that we would never think to put money into for a return on investment, like a picture of a black hole or, um, or perhaps something even more abstract, like philosophical foundations of consciousness. Um, and so what's really interesting in between, sitting in between uh, kind of the value creators, the people that produce goods and services and in industry, and between the basic science researchers, the thinkers, those that really kind of push the needle forward on innovation, is this middleman, the knowledge curator. And we're probably all really intimately aware of what they do uh, and how they work, but they kind of play both sides, right? So scientists pay to publish, industry pays to access, and scientists work for free for knowledge curators, reviewing their work, uh, finding reviewers, sitting on editorial boards. And if we kind of look at and, and, and put some numbers behind this disparity, it's pretty striking. Right. So you can take the entire UC system, the entire University of California system, something about like 20 schools and look at the value or the profit that they've been able to turn over uh, in that ecosystem for all of the intellectual property, all the patents, the inventions, the life saving vaccines, the innovative methods of space travel, new ways of looking at the universe. We put all of that together. Uh, and this number is from 2016. I see they're turning over $48 million. And a little bit of that has to do with intellectual property and, and how we think about it. Um, whereas with Elsevier, right, these, these guys are pushing almost a billion dollars in revenue creation because they've cracked a, a, a very, very lucrative business model. So how can we, how can we change this? How do we grow a self-sustaining knowledge creation community that is as prosperous as Elsevier, but as productive as the UC system? Um, here's the OPSI framework that's emerged over the past year. Um, it's very close to kind of what we initialized in the very beginning when putting these pieces together, uh, where we have the DAO, which is this ethereal uh, kind of loose knit community from all over the world of creators, researchers, uh, other DAOs, coordinators, uh, working together around this centralized mission of decentralized science. Um, and supporting that is a nonprofit called Absentia Labs, which uh, provides uh, funding and searches out funding, provides funding for fellowships and hiring a core team to custodian the services and, 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 and the needs of members that are interested in citizenship, like voting and deciding uh, how decentralized science should evolve as an ecosystem. If you're here today, you're, you get a chance to have a say how that goes. Uh, providing mentorship for others that need it. Uh, scholarship by writing and circulating uh, knowledge, uh, fellowship by research, and, and also working with the community to advance the mission of DSI and, and making sure that it's equitable and reaches as far as it can. And lastly, activism, right? Speaking up about science and making sure that it, that uh, that the fruits of knowledge really are adequately communicated and, and, and help us smooth over any tumbles as a society we might come across. Um, so our, looking back over the year, there's been a common theme that's kind of emerged in all of our activities, which is this idea of data kintsugi, which is the Japanese art of taking something broken and putting it back together in a beautiful way. Uh, and what we've really targeted are these research data silos, which is this unstructured corpus that's all around the world that's full of high value data. And with Web3, we first, for the very first time, we have the tools to build this together into a data commons that not only provides kind of like a service uh, uh, by providing information in a place that's content addressable, that's immutable, as Akshata will, will show, will, will be presenting in a couple minutes, um, but that also bootstraps open source finance tools to build positive feedback loops for growth and value. And the working model, you know, the 500 foot view of the working model that we've developed is that uh, kind of taking that overall value flow diagram and thinking how can we inject pieces of code or in, uh, pieces of architecture that help us capture the, the, the flow of value in scientific ecosystems into a public goods treasury that's used to fund open access knowledge, where open access knowledge creators provide the, the substrate for those that want to apply that research and generate goods and services. And so we've been exploring uh, a market structure for this running on Ocean Protocol as a base layer, but also leveraging many aspects of open science, such as the open science framework and uh, academic credentials and tracking contributions across the ecosystem. 
Um, here's the roadmap that's emerged over this past year for really what we want to target over these next probably three, four, five, or more years as we try to build these different aspects out. We're on the very left-hand side here where our core team is actively engaging uh, in research with neuroscientists, trying to understand exactly what their needs are, both at the institutional and individual level. How do we store data? How do we share data? What sort of data is it? And, and what can we actually expect out of academia and institutional agreements? Um, is there a way to continue forward with the system? Um, let's make sure I can let Sarah in. There we go, thank you. Um, and along the way, we're producing scholarship technical research reports to really bring the centralized old school legacy system into uh, this, this movement that we're building through construction of bridges. Uh, over these next couple months in, in 2022, we expect to put together our bench to mesh backend. Uh, and this is really Ken Shook taking the charge on this, aggregating 250 terabytes plus probably more of open access neuroscience data. Um, and archiving it. And that's something that we found is a lot of this data is missing uh, or is fragmented or and uh, or is, is in different places. And so, you know, we, we've been very happy to see that the service we're providing does have value to the community that we are helping out um, through the archival of this really important public publicly funded data. We also can expect uh, in 2022 to launch our knowledge market on the test net. So you might have seen some demos of it floating around on Discord. Uh, we're really, really excited to kind of take the next step with that and hoping to test uh, its its uh, function in institutional computing environments and to get some feedback as well on, on all that stuff. Uh, we, we hope in the future to kind of explore how we could function as a true decentralized self-governing community through our token community pilot. Whether these tokens will be financialized or reputation-based, this remains open to debates uh, as, as we kind of guide guide ourselves through as a community, all the ethical questions uh, that come about with commercialization of science and financialization, and how do we leverage both free market systems, but also nonprofit mission-driven um, uh, objectives, like making science accessible. Uh, our, our end of the road, really what we're aiming for is a Web3 science commons at the end of this, right? Where anyone, anywhere can launch their lab in the cloud. And it's, it's a lab that's part of an ecosystem of labs, which is community governed, uh, that's run by publishing collectives of individuals that um, are incentivized to review each other's work, to build uh, reputation, and to understand exactly uh, together as a community how we can move forward in advancing knowledge. It's a place where public and private research and development can come together and where the advances and, and lucrative uh, uh, achievements of, of private research and development feed right, right back into the public, to public, to the public realm. Um, so I don't, I don't want to dive into too much detail on all this stuff because we do have to get into Akshata's work. Uh, but just a couple more highlights. Uh, so over these this past year, we've really um, focused a lot on user stories research and, and journey tracking. So identifying exactly how scientists are interacting with the cloud. How do we how do, how, does, how do scientists think about their data, the services that are available, and identifying those pain points? We've also been working on these automated workflows for archival of massive neuroscience data sets. Uh, thanks again to Kinshuk's uh, pioneering work in this. We've uh, shared our knowledge marketplace demonstrator with our funders, uh, and we've been hard at work figuring out exactly how the incentive engineering and tokenomics is all going to come together. Uh, and so this has kind of led to uh, a few different products. Uh, there's the Web3 Science Data Commons, also known as Coral, is the kind of working name for the project, which is coming together. Uh, we have a toolbox for simulating tokenomics in open science ecosystems called Dark Spice, which is uh, really, really pushed forward by Jakob uh, and all of his amazing work as an open web fellow. Highly recommend you go check out his posts out on Discord or Discourse and Discord if you'd like to get caught up. Uh, but we hope to make this available to the community soon with adequate uh, documentation so that anybody could spin up their own token science community uh, and kind of understand exactly how the value is flowing through it and be able to responsibly make decisions in the construction and architecture of their community. Uh, and lastly, today, we're going to have a nice, uh, great close look in uh, Akshata's Open Web Fellowship Project on a PERMA library for scholarship. Um, so I'll get right into that. Looking forward into the future, we can expect uh, our Open Web Fellowship Cycle 3 uh, as soon as we 
get through onboarding additional mentors to support uh, any additional uh, students we want to take on. We'll be looking forward to scaling our data set archival. Uh, a big kind of project that's been incubating amongst the members in, in the DAO and also others that, that have kind of connected with OpsI is really tackling the idea of uh, open science profiles and IDs and how does how does uh, Web3 fit into all of that. And so we expect to work on that uh, and, and kind of really sketch this idea of identity out uh, in much more detail at ETH Denver and, and as part of that hackathon coming up soon. So if you haven't applied, please do consider applying. Uh, members may qualify for a travel grant. Uh, and lastly, we've been putting together scholarly content. Big shout out to Caleb uh, for his article series in decentralized file storage that will continue and in, in, uh, along with some other uh, content that we have scheduled for, for the community. So I don't want to take any more time up at all. Uh, I'd like to give Akshata uh, a chance to uh, get ready. Uh, so I'd like to introduce her first. Uh, Akshata, is, uh, she has a master's in science and physics. Uh, she came to us with a great idea, right? She already kind of knew she was she was a, a steward, a torchbearer of DSI, um, where she was really interested in the problems with publishing and sharing papers. And she thought, you know, why can't we build a permanent archival for, uh, for scientific papers? Uh, papers often disappear. Uh, the stats on that are pretty dismal if you really look into them. And you know, is there a way that we can leverage all this exciting new technology to uh, to make the dissemination of information more seamless and and more permanent? Um, so Akshata is an incredibly talented uh, fellow. She has multiple skills in programming. Uh, she's a great communicator, uh, and and uh, I'm really excited for you for you guys to hear what she has to say today. Take it away, Akshata. Thank you so much for that. Um... I'll just start sharing my screen. Yeah, is everyone able to see my screen? Hello? You're good to go. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so hello, everyone. This is Akshita, and I'm here to present vScholar. So vScholar is a decentralized library to permanently store scientific research in the form of preprints, publications, or any scholarly articles. So the agenda of today's presentation would be to discuss what the current state of publishing is, what is decentralized science, and how decentralized science can improve the current state of publishing. And then lastly, why we are building vScholar and how it implements DSI. So coming to the current state of publishing, most of the value from scientific research today is extracted by publishers. They are the ones who decide which paper should be, like whether the paper should be cop should have copyrights or not, at how much cost they are going to give access to other people for the papers. And the researchers get grant, but then they have a lot of indirect costs, such as cloud storage cost for storing their papers, cost for knowledge access, and also cost for paper submissions. And there is a huge entry barrier for the open sci independent scientist, independent scientists, because they do not have access to as many papers and as many research articles as they would have if they were a part of elite institutions. Now, coming to how the scholarly articles are preserved, the scholarly article preservation is at a risk today. So more than 84 online only journals in science and 100 in humanities have already been lost. 900 journals published online only are already at the risk of vanishing. And only one third of journals listed in the directory of open access journal ensure a long-term preservation. This is mostly because there is a very little consensus on who is supposed to store all these, whether it's the organization or the author or the publication, and it imposes a monetary risk on them, which is why these scholarly articles are at the risk. Now we'll discuss how, what is DSI and how DSI would solve these problems. Now DSI is, DSI is a decentralized science which is open to all. It is not controlled by organization or a single entity, but, but, is, but has a community of scientists who decide what would be the future of DSI. It ensures sustainability of research papers. It makes sure that the research paper which are that the research papers are permanent, they are never lost, and they're always available for the future generation. 
this is also open for everyone regardless of their background it does not it does not discriminate among whether someone is in whether someone belongs to the background or not but gives open equal access to everyone for the research paper and all the research and my favorite example of dci today are obsentia vita da ueda um now we'll come to v scholar and how it accelerates dci at v scholar we believe that knowledge should be free and accessible to all we want to make all the articles and whatever knowledge is stored on v scholar permanent so that we can create a knowledge stream for future generations we want to remove research barriers by making by making most of the research papers open access and then we also want to ensure open source collaboration and quality peer reviews now if you look at the architecture of v scholar then we are we are using react in the front end and rvv as a storage layer right now but we'll also be using ipfs and filecoin we are using r connect to sign any transaction to upload the papers and you can have your own personal library of papers here so now as soon as you enter v scholar you will be in a landing page and if you just want to search for some papers then you do not have to do anything you do not have to make any transaction you can simply search but in case if you want to upload the papers then you need to sign in with your orchid id so signing in with the orchid id ensures signing or sign up with the orchid id ensures authenticity and that no one can upload anyone else's paper without their consent so once you are signed in you can see your personal space wherein you can see all the papers that you saved for yourself and also papers you uploaded as well as you can get an option to upload new papers now once you select option to upload new papers you can upload the papers either publicly or privately in both the way you need to sign a transaction and sign a transaction which which would be in the form of rv rv tokens and all the papers that are uploaded are stored permanently there now we'll be just discussing a little bit on the storage layers that would be using so the first one would be ipfs and because ipfs has content based addressing it 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 is it makes sure that whatever content is up, you get the content that you are actually looking for because if in in normal web2 if the link changes then the content might be lost but here you you could be ensured that you are getting whatever you are looking for and if you and you can just check the hash and see whether it it, it is the same content or if someone has done something with it and also because it is not duplicated a lot many times it increases the efficiency here but ipfs also has limitations and the major limitation is unavailability of file it happens when the nodes are offline and even if your file is available you might not get that file during that time so the solution of this is incentive in incentivizing the node to store file now this is what the same people from ipfs did and built filecoin now filecoin is a decentralized storage solution it is peer to peer storage and here they are incentivizing node to store data so so you can be assured that whatever data you have uploaded you can get that back and th this works similar to aws or any centralized file storage in a way that you pay as you go now coming to rv which is which is one of the major storage layer which is the major storage layer of vscholar and it works in a different way compared to both ipfs and filecoin so rv stores your data permanently and instead of paying as you go you you simply uh, while uploading paper you pay for uh, you pay up front for 200 years and if you are wondering that 200 years would cost a lot of money then it doesn't because the cost of uploading almost 100 papers is just approximately 1 and as uh, and because the storage increase because the storage cost cost decreases every year you somehow gain interest in this um, interest in the amount that you have paid and that is how now maybe after one year as you have paid for 200 years probably you will have 220 years or something like that and hence the paper goes on for the paper is stored almost infinitely like for very long time uh, and rv therefore ensures a very long term archival of papers 
now if uh, here are some of the features of v scholar so v scholar is working for the mission of desi and it is science for all permanent storage and it reduces barriers in research uses rv to store data permanently and also allows paper to store both publicly and privately we would want the papers to store publicly mostly but then if someone who has already uploaded the papers and has copyright still want to store it in v scholar then they might also store it privately for their own reference and share it with the people they want now here are the few uh, now we have been creating a website and these are the website images so the first one is the home page second one is the second section of home page um, and here is the uh, the fourth one is the uh, uh, arconnect wallet wherein you uh, from here you can make transactions um, the support publication one is the form wherein you need to uh, the form for uploading papers and the black one is the actual transaction on rv after you upload the paper uh, you you can see you can see uh, it on the rv now the future goals the future goal of we scholar is implementing dois metadata extraction of the papers and signing when with the academic credentials um, integrating desi stack components we are we are thinking about this almost every week about how how we are going to implement this and then the long term goals would be to create scholar tokens and build a community to peer review the review articles that are there and probably in in long long future also help researchers to fund their research with the help of scholar tokens thank you so much everyone for being there and that was my presentation <laughs> that's amazing akshata that was a great great update thank you so much for looping us all in on your efforts um i'd like to open the floor to any questions from the community uh, you know feel free to uh, ask akshata almost anything <laughs> I can maybe guide the conversation a little bit. Um, Akshata, what what made you like really the most excited uh, or like really got this idea going in you? Like what's, you know, what's your, maybe you give a little personal personal background uh, how this idea really kind of got you going and stuff. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. I guess it, it would be like a coincidence that uh, I, I had recently read, like I had read about some article which told that how the research papers are lost. And then after some days, I came across RV. And then I got to know that, OK, you can store anything permanently. And then I was like, why can't we implement this for the research papers? And it would be very useful. So that's how. How do you um, kind of distinguish Sci-Hub from vScholar in your mind? That I guess whatever is uploaded here, like it would be, um, I, I mean, they would upload by their own consent and whatever is open here, it would be free to use. And I, I don't think there would be any kind of problem with it. And if, if someone is not, uh, I, I mean, if they're not comfortable with it, they can choose to store their papers privately instead. So I, I think that would be the difference. Uh, yeah, Michael, please, I see you raised your hand. Feel free to introduce yourself as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike, uh, and I'm one of the team members here at Research Rabbit. Um, Akshata, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I had a very basic question, um, and I know a lot of folks have looked at this question. I love your take because you're in the weeds, too. Um, it's regarding takedown and copyright notices. So if mm -hmm. I have a paper that is currently behind a paywall and i want mm -hmm. to submit that into v scholar um mm -hmm. how what is your latest view in terms of the copyright around that paper the legality of doing something like that um and how and if there are takedown notices how might that be handled uh so that is why uh 
I, I think that if you're not sure about whether um, it, it might have some copyright issues, then it's better to not to upload it openly because once it's uploaded there, it is not possible to take it down. So you can upload it privately for yourself if you want for some time. Then, then if you see later on that, okay, you can upload it openly as well, then maybe you can go ahead and upload the same paper, I guess, publicly. That. And is the idea that vScholar would protect, like I, one of the fears I think maybe that researchers may or may not understand that or put it up anyways, is vScholar going to somehow protect the community from breaking copyright rules? Uh, actually, the um, we, we were discussing a lot about this copyright issues and we think that the researchers themselves should take the responsibility of this. like. Like, look at it properly before uploading anything, and we are somehow going to make sure that people know about it before they upload. So, got it. Thank you. Yeah, just to uh, add on to that a little bit, and, you know, a really interesting kind of thought too is, um, you know, this is kind of a really long term horizon project where some, if you're archiving paper for very long periods, it might even outlive the copyright holder. Right, so we could even think about uh, kind of like time locks for for papers that are uh, that are uh, based on where it's coming from, what the terms are, and I think the key really here is having machine readable licenses as well. So that's kind of the big I think obstacle that we ran into thinking about data sets and and specifically personal data sets and how long those should be accessible for for putting them on a data commons. Um, and uh, I think there are some examples out there of licenses that uh, could be cons consumed by a smart contract or read uh, pointing to the ocean protocol, which has some kind of like really general adapters for deciding how long the data set should be available um, and, and the associated licenses. So, so it's just interesting to think like, you know, it could be that, you know, sure, uh, I don't know which journal, maybe let's say Elsevier goes belly up in the next 50 years, uh, but, on 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 um on v scholar these articles would still be there and they'd be archived for a while uh, we also have a uh, an additional question here uh Akshata on implementing dois yeah it, it is still the ongoing thinking about how we are going to do it we uh, we haven't come to that yet. That is why it is still in the future goals. But then I guess probably IPFS might help. I, I think it for now, we'll have to research about it more. So. Um, and just to follow up, uh, when it comes to implementing DOIs, does that mean storing the associated DOI with the papers? Or are you saying you'd like to become, or vScholar could become uh, a DOI registry, like Crossref or data no, site? No, no. Others? Not for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so just b because I, I, in IPFS also, it, it is content-based hashing, so I guess somehow it would be helpful with the DOI as well, so. Yeah, I think there's still an open question to whether um, the level of databasing that is going to occur on the back end of vScholar and then how much it will integrate with other kind of emerging components of the DSI stack, right? So. Uh, we would imagine that DOIs would probably be issued uh, and stored decentralized, um, so kind of redundantly stored across multiple shards or multiple providers uh, on, on, on the back end of a knowledge commons, right? And then vScholar is kind of just pulling and tapping into that uh, uh, service. So whereas vScholar really is just about the experience and guiding researchers through uh, archiving, archiving their papers and managing their libraries. I have one question uh, regarding the tokens. I think you mentioned that whenever a paper would be published, a token would be minted. And I'm just, I was just wondering whether there could be, whether you had some different functionality planned for the tokens, whether they would be like access tokens or just for tracking um, some metadata like academic lineage or something like that, or whether that they, whether, uh, there would be some uh, some elements like the data tokens in Ocean, or perhaps something completely different. Uh, I actually, when you upload the paper, then the tokens are not minted. If I get you correctly, that that's what you said, right? No, I I said when when you upload the paper for uploading the papers, you need to have some RV tokens for uploading. 
just to make a transaction so, uh, so that it is uploaded on RV. And then about tokens also not thought about it yet. It is ah, okay. way, way in the future. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, looks like we have a question from Krishna. Please, please feel free to introduce yourself and um, yeah, ask away. Sure. Uh, hey, folks. Uh, I'm Krishna, and I work with Mike on Research Rabbit as well. And I have a question about how vScholar plans to integrate or collaborate with other folks within the ecosystem. So, for example, uh, there are entities out there like Internet Archive Scholar who uh, are already working on open sourcing or opening up a lot of scholarly content through Arweave. And do you plan to collaborate with those groups or other DAOs like Open Access DAO, et cetera? Uh, it, it would be good to actually, but right now we were just developing the product of this, but it, it would be really good to collaborate with people for sure. But right now we haven't thought about it yet. It, it's in the yeah. very starting stage. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm answering most of the questions that it's in the future. We haven't thought, but it's really very early. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think the space is is just really kind of still emerging as well. And you know, we're working on getting our contributions to the ecosystem out there in a way that's well documented that other people can use. It's all open source. And I think you know, just with the continuation of community calls and reaching out, I'm I'm part of Open Access DAO. Uh, and uh, more than happy to explore how, how that's going to all come, come together. I know that OA DAO is focusing more on kind of a tokenomics path moving forward. So if there is synergy there, that'll be great to see how that, that'll come about. Um, I do know that there are many, um, many initiatives to archive data on the internet, uh, whether it's on Filecoin or AR Weave or some other decentralized storage technology. And I, I think a lot of this is very experimental. It'll be interesting to kind of see how these decentralized storage networks scale uh, and how they really, are they resilient to, to the stress of, of uh, storing a lot of this data? So all this is super experimental and I think it's gonna require collaboration and stress testing before we can really convince larger institutions uh, to jump on board. Yeah. Uh, ask away, Mike. Uh, so a question here that that sort of um, I was reviewing some of the slides that you had shared, um, and again, and again, very helpful presentation. Um, I know right now the ideas for researchers to upload research to vScholar. However, the problem set described was that many journals and publishers um, either fade out or are at risk of fading out. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering um, if you've had discussions with those either faded out publishers or those folks who are at risk of fading out and having them upload their materials to vScholar directly in bulk, as opposed to going to researchers where there might be sort of more friction or more adoption issues um, and questions, because the publishers definitely understand to be the issue here. Um, um, it didn't hit my mind before, but yeah, it does. It is like a really, really good idea. and. And maybe we could do that, probably, I guess. Yeah, at least we can save whatever, like, whatever we know are probably going to vanish. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, that's really, really great feedback. Uh, yeah. Like, welcome to the community. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Yeah, did you want to give it? Uh, did you want to take a chance, real quick, Mike, to tell us a little bit more about Research Rabbit while you had the floor? Yeah, sure. Um, so Krishna and I are working on Research Rabbit, uh, as well as some other wonderful folks here on the Research Rabbit team. Uh, we have built a discovery app that helps researchers visualize and discover papers and authors in completely new ways. Um, you can build visualizations on the fly, explore metadata on the fly, whatever you like. Um, and you can check us out on Twitter at Research Rabbit. Uh, there's sharing collaboration, integration with Zotero, all that sort of classic use case for researchers. Um, we're really interested in Web3 and a lot of the decentralization efforts. We're on a mission to empower researchers with a variety of technologies. And we understand that um, today, the way the system is set up is the academic system is fundamentally broken. So Web3 offers a lot of power and promise to 
to solving some of those issues as we've been talking about today. Um, one of the really interesting areas that we're exploring is around identity as well uh, and credentials, which is why we first got in touch. Um, and um, thank you again for inviting us here. Uh, Krishnan, anything that we should add there or um, other areas that I have forgotten to mention? Nope, nope. I think you got everything. <laughs> But this is definitely, um, for what it's worth, this problem around academic papers is a huge problem, not only because um, papers are behind paywalls, but also because there's no um, corpus of academic research that we can use to extract metadata from. So to the extent these papers are behind paywalls, that means we don't have abstracts, which is really important. We don't have citations, which is really important. Um, and for all, and once you get the abstracts and citations, you can then do all sorts of machine learning stuff, NLP stuff, and so on, so that you have a basis to drive a lot of the DSI initiatives. So for instance, who should get credit for what work? What is the impact of certain work? What is sort of, um, uh, how should we think about how papers relate to each other? Or what is this body of work that we want to fund? All of these things are made possible if we can get that research unlocked into the open and start working with it. Um, the most recent, I think, um, instance of this uh, concept was general index, which you may have seen. Uh, it sort of puts in a bunch of information online all at once. I know Krishnan has more details there. Um, and there's some other databases as well, but nothing that is focused on DSI specifically, nothing that is decentralized, nothing that is sort of um, uh, built by and for and driven by the people. Yeah, and I think that's key, right? So it's it's kind of difficult um, to really truly resonate with the community and build a decentralized service that addresses uh, the needs, the pain points, uh, without having those dialogues and discussions, right? So um, everything has to start somewhere, and I'm super stoked uh, to see Research Rabbit kind of really diving headfirst into this. Um, I do, you know, I do think that there's going to be some interesting kind of like portable reputation or identity. Uh, that you can take across applications, whether it's a, a, a DAP, right, a decentralized application, or whether it's your traditional old application interfaces with ORCID or OSF or something like that. And I think, you know, kind of building out that knowledge graph will start off first with all of the boring metadata, right? So who are you writing with? Um, what are the keywords attached to your paper? Um, has it been peer reviewed? Uh, and you know, I think the most interesting kind of use cases come out of that boring data when we start uh, thinking of not first level knowledge artifacts. So you have your first level base level knowledge artifacts, which are just your scientific papers and uh, data that's associated with them. And then your second level knowledge artifacts, which are about those first level. And once that's, that's, that's present and machine readable and parsable, uh, you can start building kind of like these you know, incentive loops or these kind of uh, uh, automated pipelines on top of those where, um, where high, highly trafficked uh, papers or highly trafficked data sets are served uh, in, in ways to the people that need them the most um, or that are requesting them the most, kind of thinking about uh, kind of thinking about how trends emerge within science and also the ability to identify perhaps like trends that um, might have that might be carrying forward on their own momentum, perhaps not the validity of their claims. And so kind of, it'll just, I think really, once we have unlock all this metadata, it'll give us kind of this really high level perspective on how science has been being done in real time, which which is absolutely amazing. Yes, Matt, please take, take it away. Question related to that, Shadi, and, and to you know, what you're doing with Research Rabbit, uh, Michael and, and Akshana, great presentation, that was really cool is so i just signed up for my my open science dao uh, token for the, the community and i use my my dot eth handle uh, what what do you guys think is the best way to kind of connect the metadata associated with this decentralized id and something like orchid and and the, your your scholarly record are you are you working on anything in that area, or what's the best practice there? Could you? Yeah. Um, we've we've just begun kind of talking about it informally, uh, what that schema would look like. Uh, we were planning on kind of really joining forces in um, 
in, in February at ETH Denver as part of the hackathon uh, to just really hammer. See, see how far we go with it, right? Um, we also don't want to do too much work on it just yet because uh, you know, we wanted to make it a cool activity for the hackathon. Um, I think, you know, with the PO apps, uh, the PO apps are, I'll use the word artifact again, they're kind of like an artifact in their own right. So they tell you some information about the events, uh, how frequently you've attended. And the way that I'm thinking about identity is kind of this uh, mutable index, right? So where you have a basic structure for uh, different components that might already exist in the Web3 ecosystem, like PO apps, or if you're publishing data tokens on ocean markets, that could be kind of a, a record or a log there. Um, but the ability also, in this, in a very similar way, how IDX works, having this um, index of other schemas for uh, for for contributions. So, you know, I'm really excited about uh, the general index. I had no idea about it until you mentioned it today, Mike. Um, and I think thinking of ways to uh, allow any app developer to import this module and be able to kind of define how they want that identity to carry forward in their application, like what what metrics they care about, whether it's, you know, like, you know, I, I look at impact stories actually as kind of an example or really inspiration um, of how something like this could look. An impact story is uh, kind of came out of this need to recognize contributions in open science and just kind of good practices overall. So, you know, think, let, letting the community decide because, you know, we're, you know, 18 people in the Zoom room or Google Meet room. And, you know, I'm sure that what needs to be built, somebody out there or a collection of people will have to decide uh, and converge upon for a couple iterations. So I think kind of building a really flexible infrastructure to be able to support that development is maybe the first most important goal. Um, so schemas that are lightweight, that are adaptable, that are configurable, uh, that are well documented and kind of point people towards the ecosystem so that they can keep things in mind when they're engineering um, whatever, you know, whatever their solution or identity solution is on their front end. So just out of curiosity, are there other um, identity or identifiers or profile type stuff that uh, y'all are considering? So for instance, there's ORCID, we know there's ETH, um, I guess Twitter. Is there any other sort of, um, sort of big buckets of identity that you think might be relevant for the research community? Yeah, I think there's also an opportunity to test out some new identity frameworks and see see how they go, right? Um, so let's really see how they go. And, you know, they, I think it'd be pretty cool to have a science avatar, like a portable science avatar that could be resolved on different sites and that loads my open science framework contributions uh, that, you know, pulls up my most relevant GitHub repositories. Um, I know we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I wanted to open up the floor for one more question, if there are any, and then transition over to working group updates, really short, brief ones. Okay, cool. Uh, so we just got the update from Akshata on uh, vScholar. Uh, is Caleb on the call? Would you like to give a quick update on some of the stuff you've been working on? Uh, yeah, I can go real quick. Um, yeah, so I guess right now, given the time we have, I should just say we're going to do a Twitter Spaces and talk about decentralized storage and kind of give an overview of the market and the options right now. Um, probably scheduling that for... Uh, January 8th or 15th, one of those weekends. So if that sounds interesting, definitely hop in the Discord and vote on on that. Yeah, and if you're looking for a good kind of like conversation material, you can check out his article series, uh, which is really meticulously researched. And I've learned a bunch 
uh, kind of just going through about uh, decentralized storage isn't, isn't just IPFS and Filecoin. There's a whole ecosystem there and a bit of a history. Um, and so, you know, feel free to dive in. And if you have any feedback or want to chat more, we can uh, we can have something. It's community. Um, let's see who else is on the on the bill here. Uh, Jakob, would you like to give any updates on your uh, fellowship work and some of the stuff you're doing in token communities? Yeah. So uh, I've been slowly wrapping up my my work to present at the next DAO hall, uh, which should hopefully be sometime in the next two weeks or something. Uh, so I've been writing my final report. I've also been writing the documentation for Dark Spice. And uh, I, I'm also working on refactoring some of the finished models to um, catch up with some of the updates that have been happening to Token Spice recently. Uh, there has been a whole uh, refactoring to um, Brownie instead of instead of using just Ganache. So now there's a lot more general functionality of the token engineer of Token Spice, but it's also it it also means that some of the that there needs to be uh, some code refactoring for the existing models in Dark Spice. So I'm currently working on that. Cool, awesome. Really excited to see that come out. Um, I think it'll be really useful for you know folks like Open Access DAO where they want to take the tokenomics route. And I think having a good starting place on how to run simulations on token value flows in the research community would be a really great starting point. Uh, so for those not familiar, Jakob's uh, done a lot of work engineering kind of like agents. Um, so and how they might behave and kind of templates for those to allow anyone to kind of configure um, different simulations and scenarios. Uh, we can take a look at his open up fellowship if you'd like to learn, learn more. And I also wanted to give a chance to Kinshuk, who um, last time we couldn't meet because of the time difference, the time zone difference, uh, to quickly give an update on some of the stuff you're working on. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Kinshuk. I'm mostly been working on uh, the problem of uh, archiving existing so existing data sets which are quite popular so for example we went with the neuroimaging data sets which are uh, indexed by the data added aggregators so i've been working on uh, a pipeline to on ramp that data into long term storage in filecoin and kind of thinking about what kind of metadata we should preserve so that it could be uh, so that we could use it forward looking with the marketplace and and keeping in mind some changes which might occur in those data sets in the future yeah yeah it's it's pretty great stuff i think uh Kinshuk's pretty much got a nice skeleton for an automated pipeline to be pulling data map, uh, off of data lad and uh archiving it uh, procedurally on on filecoin We've run into some issues with data availability and outages as well. So it seems like a really good step forward. And uh, just a couple of minutes here. I also wanted to give a chance to uh, Prakash, if you're still on the call, uh, to introduce yourself and maybe give an update of our most recent kind of work together. Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yes, I can I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah this is Prakash. I'm from uh, Bangalore. and. Uh, uh, recently, I, I think I've been trying to come on Offensive Town Hall for quite a while. Uh, now I've got a record chance to. So uh, recently, Sherry and I, I think we wrote a proposal to help one of my colleagues uh, get a grant in the recent uh, Ocean Dow down. And it was mostly to uh, aggregate an open science kind of passport, uh, which will be more uh, useful for collecting data points from healthcare data in terms of like, first we start off with uh, slightly non-sensitive data like randomized uh, lab reports. So that's the first agenda that we are aiming to. So we are hoping that the workflow will be conducive for such a use case that I think uh, Shiri was kind enough to uh, pick up some of his work from the archive where uh, the, the wireframes are already there uh, from other earlier work done by Shiri and his team. So that was quite useful uh, to push our proposal to uh, be happy to support anyone who wants to work on that any more uh, 
uh, Katie can uh, say more about that as well. Thank you, Prakash. Yeah, we're, we're super excited because we got this uh, grant from Ocean Dow to take this concept that we did for HackFS over the summer uh, a little bit farther. And uh, we're working with a bunch of medical practitioners and doctors that have access to some great diagnostic data. Uh, so kind of thinking how we could use that to, uh, you know, start building out pipelines for, for decentralized data that, um, you know, is based off of ethical use of, of patient data. So uh, you can take a look at the proposal there. Uh, and, and if you're interested in working on that, you can always uh, hit up Prakash uh, or myself, and we'll connect you with the right right people. Uh, it is the top of the hour. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for the last hour hall of the year. Uh, really looking forward to ringing it in uh, 2022. One final round of applause for Akshata. Uh, amazing, amazing presentation. We're so excited to see V Scholar come together. Um, and let's keep the conversation going. Let's keep hacking DSI away. Uh, Discord, discourse, you know where it's at. I'll meet you guys on Twitter. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Happy New Year.